Hi, can you tell me if you have in stock any 35 Whalens? A good bolt action, you know, like a uh, Remington 700 or Ruger. Nothing, huh? Haven't seen one for a while? Okay, thanks a lot. I'll try someplace else. Yes. Hi, can you tell me if you have in stock any uh, 35 Whalens? Good bolt action. No, haven't seen one for a while, huh? Okay, thanks a yeah. lot. Yeah, what's a, what's a bolt action? Uh, rifle. Uh, okay, never mind, I called the wrong place. Bye-bye. You think you do? Are you kidding me? <laughs> the other guy just sold it an hour ago. Okay, no more in stock though, huh? Thanks a lot. All right, bye-bye. Welcome back. I never did find one of those 35 Whalens in a bolt action. There are a few out there in the uh, auction market, but uh, I prefer to find a new one if I can. The 35 Whalen has a very interesting history. You know, around about the early 20s, uh, Vice President Thomas Riley Marshall declared that what this country really needs is a good five cent cigar. Well, he's probably one of the first Democrats that ever said anything correct, but all that being said, what they really needed was a good, stout, big game caliber that this country didn't have at the time at an affordable price. Well, we had the, uh, the, the 375 H&H Magnum was available for people who really wanted to have a heavy gun to go after uh, big bears and uh, long range shots at uh, elk and things like that. But we really didn't have anything affordable. You see, in those days, this action right here was about all that was available. These, not, not the Model 70 per se, but a long action Springfield uh, or Enfield rifle was really the only uh, rifle action available. And if you were to get a 375, it meant that you had to spend at least twice as much uh, for a very expensive, very heavy, uh, usually British-made rifle, Holland and Holland or something like that, uh, with its extra long action to handle uh, the 375. And the 375 was really a little bit more than uh, any American needed to, uh, it, you know, it was really far more powerful than any American needed for the largest bears and, and, and elk and anything else that uh, he might track down. But the, um, the, what occurred was that in about 1922, an individual named James V. Howe, uh, who was uh, actually, he was the foreman machinist at the Rockford Arsenal under uh, Colonel Whalen. Now, Colonel Townsend Whalen was a uh, extraordinary rifleman. In fact, that was his, that was his nickname, was the rifleman. This is the rifleman's rifle, the Model 70, but he was known as the rifleman in his day. He knew everything about rifles, not only knew about them mechanically, but uh, this individual who was in charge of Frankfurt Arsenal uh, had hunted worldwide. He had uh, great skill and accomplishment as a, as a marksman himself. On command, he could fire 10 shots at a human silhouette 200 yards away and strike six shots, uh, six hits, at least six hits in 10 seconds. Now, think about that, that's an extraordinary amount of skill. Um, and that was with an open-sighted uh, Springfield. And um, we're not talking about peep sights either, we're talking about aligning blades, uh, open blades, that's, a, that's extraordinary marksmanship. Well, he hunted everything, he had a lot of, uh, he had a lot of articles. Uh, he wrote for the uh, American Rifleman for the NRA. Uh, he wrote for many different publications through his life. And he produced many uh, various books uh, about hunting and shooting and accurate rifles. He was the one that declared that only an accurate rifle is interesting. And, I, and that's, that's my motto too. I, I, I have adopted his personal motto that only an accurate rifle is interesting. I really don't have much use for a rifle that, aside from, aside from having a fun rifle to plink with like a Model 94 or something like that, um, 
I, I still I still really uh, like to have an extremely accurate rifle, and that's what my uh, that that's what my zeal is. James V. Howe, under the um, while he was as the foreman machinist at uh, Rockford Arsenal under uh, Townsend Whalen, Colonel Whalen, he developed a, a cartridge which was essentially a uh, blown out, necked out uh, version of the 3006 to 35 caliber. Now, it was about as simple as that. Uh, the 35 Whalen is exactly in all the, in, in all of the dimensions except its uh, bore diameter. It's exactly the same shoulder dimension, same shoulder angle, uh, same uh, case uh, wall slope. Same head diameter. Everything was identical. It's simply, uh, it, it's simply a very simple uh, opening of the uh, mouth to 35 caliber. What occurred with that uh, simple little development was probably one of the most efficient uh, examples of the 3006 case that uh, there is, even to this day. The 35 Whalen has a remarkable. Uh, ability to maintain uh, the same velocities throughout its bullet weights that uh, heavier 3006 uh, bullets will maintain. I'll give you an example, 200 grain, just think about this for a second, a 200 grain uh, 35 Whalen bullet, a Spitzer pointed bullet, uh, travels out at over 2900 feet per second with safe, with safe pressures. Uh, a 225 uh, grain 35 Whalen will travel out at uh, the same trajectory as 180 grain 3006, and uh, with virtually the same with virtually the same uh, trajectory throughout its flight out to 400 yards. And we're talking we're talking a difference that it lags it lags under it by only about a less than an inch and a half at 400 yards when sighted in at 200 yards. Um, now the 35 Whalen is not a long range cartridge. It was developed uh, to fill a, a, a very sorely needed gap in the uh, American market, rifle market. As I said, there was, there was really no uh, heavy bore for suitable for hunting uh, big game, truly big game, uh, with authority, with the ability to uh, tackle the largest bears, the grizzlies, uh, you know, any, any bear whatsoever, uh, even, even uh, going into Canada and the, and the Yukon, Anything like that. The, the 35 Whalen was up to the task. It had a, it had a very large uh, bore. Uh, it was now I think it's larger than a 338 uh, bore. So it doesn't have it doesn't have quite the sectional density that you'll find in most modern uh, 338s. But the 338 bore was really not uh, anything that was uh, around at the time. That was a that was an invention that came around later. But the 35 bore opened up an extremely wide wound channel. Uh, it, was, it was a hard-hitting cartridge on a game, up to and including elk and, and big bear, uh, Kodiak bear, anything like that. And, and it did it with aplomb. Throughout its history, since, the, uh, since its introduction in 1922, uh, it really has never, it's never been faulted by anybody who ever used it. Uh, one of its remarkable characteristics is that it's, uh, because, because it has an ideal velocity range of between 2,600 feet per second for the 250 grain bullet. 2,600 feet per second for a 250 grain bullet. That's an, that's an astonishing amount of power. Um, you know, and, and it, uh, it, it has uh, everything that it needs to really uh, crush bones and uh, on, on really truly big game. So it had a very, very uh, good following among uh, wildcat-minded uh, shooters, people who were not uh, who were not afraid to go out and buy a, a wildcat rifle that was not being commercially produced and a chambering that was not generally widely available. Its uh, ability to be able to take down big game, however, uh, also came with a very uh, nice factor that it was not uh, overly destructive. While it, while it opened a wide wound channel and could bore all the way through, um, it didn't it didn't cause a lot of capillary destruction of tissue, so the surrounding tissue didn't uh, get mangled because of the velocities. The velocities were very well within the, the ideal range of, of uh, the mid-20s to the high-20s uh, at any, at any uh, distance. 
uh, which is which is perfect for for uh, any kind of game rifle. Um, it was uh, it was widely sought uh, by by individuals who uh, knew what its uh, capabilities were. Well. Uh, it, it really was supplanted, uh, you know, it was really supplanted uh, later on when the, in the later 50s and the, in the 60s as they came along and commercial cartridges were introduced which uh, offered similar ballistics uh, in a commercial form. For instance, the 350 Remington Magnum was offered in kind of a silly, absolutely ridiculous uh, version of a gun. It was a, a very short uh, model 600 Remington and then later in the 660 Remington which increased its length from 18 to 20 inches but it was a ridiculously uh, short uh, light uh, pulverizing uh, gun which uh, really hurt when you shoot it. Um, but the 35 Wayland does all this with uh, the same powder uh, charge that a 3006 uh, performs with. So with a roundabout 56 to 58 grains of powder or so, uh, it's able to achieve full velocity. That's a, that's a, a very, very uh, important factor in terms of recoil. One of the most difficult uh, situations for, uh, most, for most hunters who go afield is uh, the ability to develop good marksmanship with uh, a rifle. That's, you know, that's that's a great, uh, that's, that's the most important thing of all, to develop great marksmanship with the rifle that you're going to hunt with. And uh, the, the limiting factor with a 338 Winchester Magnum, extraordinarily good as it is for, for hunting big game, is its, its recoil. Its recoil is well over th uh, 30 uh, pounds of free recoil. And a lot of shooters simply don't like over 30 pounds of free recoil. Most shooters really can't stand much over 23, 24 pounds of free recoil. That's about where the 7 millimeter Remington Magnum is, and that's why the 7 millimeter Remington Magnum is a very popular rifle with uh, a padded stocked rifle of standard weight, is because it develops around 23, 24 foot pounds of recoil. Well, that's exactly where the 35 Whalen is. The 35 Whalen develops around 23 or 24 foot pounds of recoil, and it does it with only 58 grains of powder, and not the 68 or so uh, grains of powder, 71 grains of powder that a 338 Winchester Magnum is uh, pushing out uh, and causing a substantial amount of recoil. So these are these are the uh, its great attributes good long range capability out to three, at least 300 yards on, on a large game with very good trajectory. Um, I'm talking about point blank trajectory now without having to hold over anything. Um, and it has extraordinarily good wound channel, uh, acceptable energy uh, for any big game. Uh, and you know, you don't, don't flip to pages of a uh, you know, chart and write to me and say that there are more powerful cartridges. I know there are a lot more powerful cartridges out there, tremendously more powerful cartridges out there. That's not the point. It's not better than the other cartridges because it has more power. It's, it's lesser in that regard. It's better because it has less recoil. And because it has less recoil and it can be handled in much the same way that a standard 3006 or a 7 millimeter Remington Magnum can be handled and get the job done on big, big game, that's, that's where its ace is. So it's a very, very, uh, it's, it's a very good cartridge in all regard. Now, why don't we see it around any, uh, anymore? In fact, a lot of people probably have never even heard of it. And I think that's, that's, the, that's the unfortunate uh, pro problem with uh, so many cartridges. We are, uh, just like every other market, we're limited by what the market uh, has been able to uh, sell to the public. I can't begin to name uh, the number of very good wildcat cartridges that should have caught on and uh, didn't catch on, and in many cases were better than uh, other cartridges uh, that are commercially very popular. Uh, the, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, there have been there have been a lot of cases uh, situations where a good cartridge has been developed by somebody, but it just didn't it didn't catch fire and nobody was interested. Well, such was the uh, situation with the 35 Whalen. The 35 Whalen 
was not noticed by the uh, commercial industry. A little bit about its history. Um, James V. Howe, who was the, uh, as I told you, was the uh, foreman machinist at Frankfurt Arsenal under Colonel Townsend Whalen, uh, he had a strange matchup with a uh, man named Seymour Griffin. And uh, if those names all of a sudden come together for you, it's Griffin and Howe is the name of the company right now uh, that, that still sells ex uh, extremely good fine shotguns and rifles, uh, high grade. Uh, if you go to their catalog, you might see prices that you've never seen on uh, rifles before. If we're talking like $55,000 for a used rifle, that sort of thing. So they market, they market the good stuff. Mr. Seymour Griffin, uh, he, read, he read about the exploits of uh, Theodore Roosevelt on his return from a safari. So Theodore Roosevelt went, a, went on safari in Africa in, uh, in uh, 19, let's see, that was 1909. And he stayed for a year on safari. He, bought, he brought cases of Winchester rifles with him. He was a great, he was a very fond of Winchester rifles. Um, he brought cases of rifles and ammunition and supplies with him for a year-long hunt in uh, 1909, and he stayed in, until a year later. And he wrote about those exploits. And uh, he was the one thing that he criticized the uh, Springfield rifle for was the fact that the stock was lousy. It just it just was not a good uh, good sporter stock for uh, civilian style shooting. Uh, it was a military rifle, and uh, he he wanted to have a, a little bit more substantial. And he was also he was also fond of uh, you know good looking guns. So Seymour Griffin uh, was a carpenter, a cabinet maker, and uh, he noticed this and he said, well, yeah, maybe I can you know, turn out something. So he acquired some French, high-grade French walnut, and uh, he started putting together rifles that everybody loved. They, they thought these, these guns were beautiful because he was, he was able to uh, you know, really put a class uh, look on a uh, military uh, rifle and, and turn it into a sporter. Well, Colonel Townsend Whalen noticed his efforts, but his criticism was that he needed to have some decent metal work done on those guns. If he really wanted to spruce them up, he needed to have a good, he needed to have a good uh, person in charge of uh, making those uh, rifles look good from all uh, aspects, not just the wood, but also from the, from the uh, steel. So he recommended that Mr. Griffin uh, partner up with James V. Howe, who was his uh, foreman in the shop and uh, who was a, a very good, uh, capable machinist, uh, and they did, and uh, they, they forged a company known as Griffin and Howe. Well, that Griffin and Howe company now, uh, that's, that's still in business. Um, it was for a time acquired by uh, Abercrombie and Fitch. Abercrombie and Fitch, you know, right now is uh, it's, it's kids' clothes, you know, sexy ads and things like that. In that day, that was the Cabela's of the day. That was the that was the Bass Pro Shop of the day. Actually, it went beyond that. That was the uh, in the twenties. Uh, in fact, even before the twenties, if you were, if you were going on safari uh, in Africa, or if you were going down to South America, or going on a, a trip up in uh, the wilds of British Columbia, or anything like that, or out in the Rockies. Uh, you went to Abercrombie and Fitch to get outfitted. You got your canoe, you got your paddles, you got your coat, you got your hat, your piss hat, whatever you needed to have, and your rifles and shotguns. They had it, the boots and everything. So that was that was how uh, Abercrombie and Fitch first started out. And so through the years, Abercrombie and Fitch uh, ended up purchasing Griffin and Howe, and uh, that that became that became uh, a a. a um, a failure after a number of years when Abercrombie and Fitch eventually went out of business and uh, until it was reorganized. But so these things are all going on, but that's where you get these names. And there has been some discussion uh, through the years of whether Colonel Townsend Whalen uh, actually designed the 35 Whalen or it was uh, divine, uh, designed by uh, James V. Howe. Well, I think that there might be a little bit of controversy about that based on the fact that Colonel Townsend Whalen uh, penned in an uh, American Rifleman uh, article some years later that uh, it was the first, it was the first uh, cartridge that he uh, designed. Um, but you've got to remember that there was a, there was a, 
there was a thing going on here at the time where uh, James V. Howe was the guy who was the machinist. Colonel Townsend Whalum was not a machinist. Colonel Townsend Whalum was a rifle shooter, and he he was a hunter and a writer, uh, but he was not a he was not a machinist. So it's it, you know the logic the logic would point to the fact that uh, James V. Howe was the actual uh, machinist who put together the reamer uh, to uh, and and bored that rifle out in order to make it into the 35 Whalum. So it had to be at least a cooperative effort, and I don't think that uh, Colonel Townsend Whalum would uh, be in the least bit. Uh, insulted uh, to uh, announce that it was James V. Howe that uh, helped him out uh, greatly in, in uh, coming up with a caliber that was very, very formidable. Well, <clears throat> as so many things go, the 35 Whalen marched on as a, uh, a very accomplished rifle, but only known by those who um, were willing to uh, purchase Wildcat rifles Wildcat rifles being rifles that are not commercially produced, and uh, the the commercial the commercial production uh, of uh, the 35 Whalen didn't even begin until 1988 when Remington finally adopted it as an official chambering. Well, you know, by 1988, Colonel Townsend Whalen had been dead for over 20 years, and very few people uh, really knew uh, that much about Colonel Townsend Whalen. Uh, people that is who were still of age to uh, be of a mind to go out with a 35 Whalen to go hunting. Anybody who really knew about uh, Colonel Townsend Whalen by that time were getting on a little bit and uh, they, they probably were not that uh, interested in purchasing a rifle uh, to do that sort of thing. But younger shooters certainly wouldn't have known about uh, Colonel Townsend Whalen and that name probably meant absolutely nothing to them in 1988. To further compound the error of Remington, as they sometimes have done in the past, they, they, they selected a, a very lousy uh, platform for the, for the cartridge. They offered it in their, they offered it in, uh, their pump. Uh, pumps and, you know, they're wonderful rifles. I, I, I fully uh, enjoy shooting a, a Remington pump, very, very accurate and everything else. But they, it's just not the right category of market for the person who's looking for a, uh, for a heavy game cartridge like that, going after big bears and, and uh, elk. You're talking about the bolt action fan. Well, they finally, did, they finally did smarten up and they came out with the Model 700 shortly thereafter. But you know, see, this is where, this is where sometimes marketing just uh, fails. Uh, and they, they brought it out at the wrong time, probably uh, 20 or 30 years way too late. Uh, if, it, if, if it had come out in the, if it had come out commercially uh, back when Griffin and Howe first started producing them and uh, selling them as high grade, remember we're talking high grade guns in a time when uh, in the late 20s, 1929, the stock market crashed and uh, America was in serious trouble and nobody was buying much of anything except a loaf of bread when they could find it. So. Uh, the timing was totally wrong, and uh, it, it upset the apple cart, and the, the 35 Whalen just didn't uh, catch on. And then, of course, by the time the 50s and 60s came on, then the Winchester and uh, Remington, uh, you know, cartridge wars came on, and each one was coming out. It seemed like they were coming out with a new cartridge every six months, and uh, you know, and the and the big thing at the time were the belted magnums. So a 35 Whalen just didn't look very impressive against a belted Magnum. It had that, oh, oh see, it doesn't look any different than my 3006. Uh, you know, well, nobody really understood the effectiveness of the 35 Whalen and how uh, how good it really was. It wasn't glamorous. It didn't it didn't shoot at over 3,000 feet per second, and it didn't come with 26 inch barrels because it didn't need it. Uh, with standard 22 and 24 inch barrels, it got the job done because it had a very very efficient bore. Matter of fact, uh, its, uh, it's, it's uh, powders generally tend to be uh, the slightly quicker burning powders, medium burning powders like uh, reload, of, reload of 15 and Varget and things like that, as opposed to the slower burning powders that a heavy bullet in a 3006 will require, such as 4350 and 4831 and reloader, uh, the, the higher series reloader 17 and things. So, uh, it, in all regards, uh, it, it it's extremely efficient cartridge, and people who have uh, people who who have discovered the 35 Whalen uh, have have discovered certain very very accommodating traits, 
it's, it's also not too big for deer. Uh, you can shoot a small doe with a 35 Whalen and drop her uh, without, without massacring the meat, without um, putting a stovepipe hole through her. Uh, you can, you know, people have discovered they can actually shoot a rabbit with it without blowing the rabbit up. So it has that ideal combination of big, big bullet diameter without, uh, you know, without explosive uh, ex expansion and explosive destruction because of uh, high velocity. High velocity, and I've said this before, when you get up beyond 2,900 feet per second into that realm, when a, uh, impact velocity, uh, you know, capillary damage starts spreading out very, very broadly beyond uh, just the vital uh, lung area, and then you start affecting the nearest tissue. Well, what's the nearest tissue? It's the, the best meat on that critter. It's, it's up, you know, right behind, right, right behind the shoulders up above, the saddle of an animal, that is, the, that is really classic uh, eating up there, and that's the first thing that goes. So your tenderloins go, your back straps go, all that stuff is just destroyed because the lung tissue uh, the lung tissue destruction goes way beyond itself and it ends up into the uh, back strap and the, and the, and the uh, tenderloins and, and your nice chops and all that stuff. And so uh, the 35 Whalen had that nice combination of effectiveness. Well, here we are, we're now into the, uh, we're, we're now into the uh, next millennium and the 35 Whalen, it seems like it's, it's breathing its last gap. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing I'm seeing a little bit of interest in it in some uh, in, in some writings. Uh, I'm I'm seeing some uh, interest in in terms of um, people who are looking for a low recoiling, uh, heavy caliber, something that they can actually handle that that won't that won't pulverize them, and also something that you can shoot. Not just you know, it's one thing to be able to say, well, you can shoot a a 338, uh, you know, Winchester Magnum or a 338 uh, Lapour. Uh, well, you might not necessarily want to do that with a uh, eight-pound rifle that's scoped uh, from the prone position, looking over some, uh, you know, prickly pear cactus. That's not that's not necessarily the the best thing to discover uh, is a is, is blood running down the side of your face because of a deep scope cut. Um, that's that's the reality when you have an extremely heavy recoiling rifle. Uh, the 35 Whalen can be fired from all positions. It can be fired comfortably sitting. Standing, kneeling, prone, whatever, whatever you would shoot a 306 with a military rifle, uh, with a with a nicely stocked rifle, just like this one here. This is a this is a model, a standard model 70 featherweight. I wouldn't be in the least bit, uh, I wouldn't be in the least bit afraid to uh, get a uh, even a featherweight uh, in a 35 Whalen. Although it would be a, it would be a little bit uh, nicer to can you know light, uh, nicer to uh, shoot uh, with a uh, heavier barrel. And it wouldn't be overly, it, it actually, with a 24-inch barrel, this has got a 22-inch barrel. With a 24-inch barrel, a, uh, a 35 Whalen would actually weigh no more than this because, remember, it has the same diameter outside, but it has a, small, it has a larger diameter bore, which reduces the thickness of the steel. So you can get away with having a longer barrel, 24 inches, even 26 inches on a, a 35 Whalen. And you're still not going to have an overly heavy uh, rifle because with a slender tube, you're still going to have uh, you're still going to have a thin barrel wall. So it's still uh, re relatively light. So I can't really say that I'm, I I can effectively beat the drum for the 35 Whalen, but I will I will say that if you're looking for a very very effective uh, big game cartridge, and really it's it's it. it it could be considered truly an all-purpose cartridge for practically anything, for deer hunting, uh, for moose, for caribou, uh, for whatever, and you can feel very confident out to ranges of 250 to 300 yards with it with no difficulty whatsoever. And on the biggest, on the biggest game, uh, the most dangerous bears uh, within, and, and because it's got a big bullet, uh, it, it can blast through uh, a thick uh, alder thickets and things like that. So it's a very, very effective cartridge. It has had uh, nothing but good reviews through its uh, history since uh, almost 100 years ago we're getting to. So uh, look for the 35 Whalen if you can find one. And uh, if you do find one, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and God bless.